Hey, this is the San Francisco Big Analytics. So um, <clears throat> I'm one of the organizers. My name is Chester Chen. I'm actually working on the GoPro. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> we uh, have this uh, monthly event. I mean, sometimes a multiple event, multiple time, uh, multiple events in per month. Uh, and cover the wide range of the data related uh, topics. Uh, could it be data infrastructures, uh, data engineering, data analytics, uh, machine learning, machine learning infra infrastructures, and so a wide range of topics. Um, so uh, today we have the uh, special guest, I mean, from the Zier AI, and they're talking about semantic search and the neural information retrieval. So without further ado, I mean, take over, please. All right. Uh, well, Chester, thank you uh, very much for having me. Um, I hope uh, this is going to be an interesting session for everyone. Um, I, I mentioned to Chester earlier as well, if, if anyone has questions, uh, put them up in chat and Chester will just interrupt me. Uh, I want uh, to make sure that all of you get as much out of this as you can. Um, so we will be talking today about semantic search and neural information retrieval. It's a, it's a very interesting intersection of machine learning and deep neural networks, language understanding, and big data processing uh, all in one field. So I hope you're going to find it interesting. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's just jump right in. And I'm going to just begin by giving you a little bit of background on me. Um, so I'm the co-founder of Zero AI. We started this company, me uh, and my co-founder, Thalat, who's also on the call in 2020. Uh, we were both at Google before. Uh, so uh, some key points, uh, I spent 10 years in Google, mostly in research, working on language understanding with neural networks uh, and specifically researching how to make deep neural networks understand human language in a more human-like way. Uh, and how to, how to leverage that for large scale information retrieval. So I was leading a team in that area from 2016 to 20, um, but because I'm also a, an engineer, I was very interested in practical applications within products at Google. Uh, so my, my research was applied in many products within cloud. Uh, there's a few examples listed on the slide. And as a result, I also ended up working in a lot of the auxiliary components of a full information retrieval pipeline and applying neural networks in those areas as well. So for instance, uh, re-rankers, uh, the problems of statistical calibration, uh, and then issues related to productionizing uh, neural networks on large data sets. Uh, as many of you know, they are very CPU intensive, so it's not, it's not trivial to make them scale with low latency over very large data sets, all right? Uh, so that's a little bit about my background. And uh, today I said we're gonna talk about semantic search, it's a term that's had multiple meanings over the past several decades. So I want to uh, be very specific uh, about what I'm talking about. Let's, let's first take a quick look at what the term semantic means. The word semantic according to the dictionary means of or related to meaning in language. So a semantic search is just a search that considers meaning when it's retrieving information, retrieving content from documents. You put in a query, it considers the meaning of that query. And in that sense, a keyword search, uh, the kind that you get from Elasticsearch or a, a Solar, Apache Solar, is also a semantic search. If it wasn't, it wouldn't be useful. So uh, this is really not a very specific uh, terminology, but when I'm talking about semantic search, what I'm specifically talking about is a type of search uh, that involves the use of deep neural networks uh, and technology that didn't exist before the year 2017. Uh, and I'll provide an overview of how that technology was developed uh, a little bit later in this talk. Uh, and to use those techniques to get a quality of search, a search experience that exceeds what a keyword search can do. Okay, so this is what I mean when I'm talking about semantic search, uh, and it's part of this field of neural information retrieval. And I think to motivate uh, what semantic search is, uh, it will help to draw a contrast uh, with what keyword search is. So let me begin by uh, providing you a brief overview of a keyword search with a motivating example. And the motivating example here is, uh, imagine I come to this um, search, maybe it's specialized for pets and pet adoptions, and I search for dog adoptions in Silicon Valley. Okay, uh, so now with the keyword search, um, I'm going to be searching over a, a large set of documents, maybe I have 10 or 20,000 listings, and I need to try and somehow retrieve the most relevant ones. So every one of these words appears in some of these documents. And 
in some cases, multiple words from the query appear in a single document, and somehow those documents should be boosted up. Um, words like Silicon Valley uh, present a challenge because Silicon Valley is one concept. So although it's two words, we really want to see both of those weird words appear side by side. Um, and in general, uh, algorithms like TFIDF and DM25 will consider the statistical property of these words, uh, the, the mutual information essentially between uh, the terms and the query and the documents, uh, and produce some sort of ranking or ordering uh, of, of the documents. Now, words like in are a special case because they essentially appear in almost every document. Uh, so they're not really informative from the perspective of a keyword search, and they tend to be eliminated uh, directly in the search pipeline. So that step is called stop word removal. The other thing that uh, uh, keyword search engines will do is they'll stem words. So the word adoptions will become, for example, adopt, so that you can match adoptions, adopting, adopted, uh, and all the different forms of that word uh, in, in the documents. All right, so uh, stemming and uh, stop word removal are configured out of the box uh, in uh, Lucene, Solar, Algolia, Elasticsearch. You get these out of the box, but to really make the search intelligent, uh, I, I wanna be able to uh, return a result uh, like bulldog adoptions in Mountain View. Uh, and everything I've shown you so far isn't going to do that. So the, key, the, the keyword search system needs a little more intelligence. So for instance, it needs to know that bulldogs, chow chows, beagles, and collies are all types of dogs. And that Silicon Valley actually consists of many towns and cities, including San Jose, Mountain View, Sunnyvale, and Cupertino. And this step is called term expansion. And <clears throat> when I expand the terms in this way, I get a whole set of new queries that I can run and retrieve a much richer set of results. I can cast a wider net, uh, as it were. And so finally, I can reach that goal where I search for dog adoption in Silicon Valley, and I can return a result for a bulldog uh, for adoption in Cupertino. And the issue with this in the keyword search, anytime you're trying to deal with language in terms of lists uh, or, or uh, hard zero one type of rules is that you start running into the uh, exceptional cases immediately and they can be severe in some cases. So now imagine that someone uh, uses the search system we developed and searches for good hot dogs in Silicon Valley. And now the system goes and it makes the substitution uh, for dogs and Hopefully, as you can see, this is inappropriate. Uh, this is going to give you bad results. Uh, companies like uh, Google and Microsoft, which operate commercial search engines, actually have teams dedicated just to the problem of term expansion and handling these cases gracefully and handling them well, let's say, for 99% of cases. Uh, but therein lies the problem of keyword search. Uh, as you try to take the search quality up, uh, the cost of developing that system and then maintaining that system and the overall complexity of the system rises exponentially. So you can set a basic keyword search up using Elasticsearch in minutes on your data set now. Uh, but to really take it to the level where it has term expansion working and it feels intelligent uh, to users, uh, your cost will rise exponentially. And that's the, the playing field that neural information retrieval uh, levels. So that small organizations, when they leverage neural networks to search their content, can get an almost Google-like search experience over their internal data sets, all right? So let me now um, take you with that background on how a keyword search operates and show you uh, through an actual demo, uh, a neural search. And this is running on the Zero AI platform. And it's very simple. We just took customer reviews for this Netgear Nighthawk router and we uploaded them into the platform and we can perform searches. And I'm gonna perform the search that's here on this slide. Can I stop my child from using the internet? It's a good, good motivating search um, to show the capabilities. So let me switch tabs. And I hope you can all now see on my screen, uh, Netgear Nighthawk router. I'm in the demo. We actually have several products indexed in the demo, but I'm gonna to stick to the router for now. And let me put the query in. Can I stop? All 
All right. And the query ran and it ran our platform returned a bunch of reviews that it thinks matches. And within the reviews, it actually is able to highlight what it thinks is the most relevant portion of the review. So let's look at a couple here. Um, the title, full signal strength throughout the house is not related, but here's a sentence. I like being able to disable the internet when my son plays video games. Okay, so in this sentence, uh, internet is there, but child is not there. The word son is there. Uh, but of course your son is also your child. However, I didn't have to configure any term expansion list. The neural network understands language well enough that it can return this match, even though the word son is being used instead of child. Okay, looking at the second example, there's no way to block social and time-wasting sites at night for your children's devices. Um, in this example, a, a variant of children is present, uh, but look, the, the word internet is not being used. Social and time-wasting sites. It's clearly talking about the internet. The concept is related, but the exact words are not being used. So semantic search can return these kinds of results over any data set. Let me just contrast it for you with uh, Amazon. I'm gonna actually copy this query just to make it quick. If I come to Amazon's page for the Netgear Nighthawk router, uh, here they've got this uh, have a question box. And I'm gonna put in my question. Can I stop my child from using the internet? And let me, if you look at these results, they're not relevant at all. And if I go to customer reviews, these results are not relevant at all. And you can see how it's latched onto words like stop and internet, but doesn't understand how the words are connecting and what the, the actual meaning of that query is. It's just these results are all over the place. And if, if I put in a different query like parental controls and go to customer reviews, these are good results now. Uh, and, and that's kind of the problem with keyword search. It, it's hit and miss. If you use the right term, you can get a beautiful result. But if you use another term, which means the same thing, you might get nonsense. Um, and, and that's the trouble. Uh, that's the trouble. It can frustrate your users in certain contexts of decision-making context. Uh, the missing relevant data can have a very high cost associated with it as well. Uh, so for instance, in the legal field, all right? Uh, there's one more capability that I'd like to show you uh, with our semantic search platform, which is the ability for it to work across languages. So we can index content across languages and we can also run queries across languages. So I'm going to go to Google Translate uh, and I'm just going to show an English Chinese example because our system works well with Chinese. So for the same router, I'm going to ask, uh, can I get good signal outside? Okay. And if I just copy this and I put it here, Okay, uh, great signal. We have two acres of property and can get signal anywhere inside and outside our home. People often ask me when they see uh, this kind of result, are you taking the query, translating it to English and then running it on your corpus? And that's not what's actually happening here. And that wouldn't work because the reviews themselves could potentially be in multiple languages. So if you just target a translation into English and then run that query, you're going to miss searching all the reviews in other languages. So what's actually happening here is that the neural network that's processing the query is embedding, which means you know, turning that query into a vector uh, and then performing the match in this vector space. And somehow uh, the vector space, the geometry of the vector space actually corresponds to the semantics of language and meaning, okay? Um, so I can, I can actually probably go back in here. And if I say, let me see, can I get good signal outside? Um, um, on the street, you know, I'll, I'll make it a little more specific and see if it can pick up on that nuance in the question. Uh, the top result didn't change. If I look at the second result, we live in a city halfway up a high rise building and we can still get a signal from downstairs on the street. So, you know, it, could, it was able to pick up on that nuance as well. All right, um, so please stop me if you have any questions. Um, oh, sorry, I see there's a question here. Uh, so is semantic search using a knowledge graph to know that Silicon Valley is a place and know that nearby places are also good results? Um, so the, the answer to that question is that there's, um, there's different ways to do it. Uh, one is with an explicit knowledge graph. 
but in the case of the systems I'm showing you, uh, this knowledge is actually learned implicitly and contained within the neural network. Um, so it's not, uh, it's not searching an explicit knowledge graph, but it's got that knowledge contained within it. Uh, and then is the net is the neural net the same for all searches or custom if i search for best net on a router uh, will it know uh, it is different from the same search on a badminton set uh, so that's an interesting question so yes uh, it is able to take advantage of context uh, to do the matching um, and at the same time and this will be maybe be a little confusing it is actually the same neural network uh, so i think um, the position of our company and I think uh, of other players who are commercializing this technology is that while it is possible to get better performance by training a neural network specifically on a data set, uh, most commercial applications, the customers don't have even training data sets ready uh, to train on in the first place. There may be too little data in those data sets. So the, really the path to commercialization of this technology is, is with general purpose neural networks that have a broad understanding of the world around them and can do better than keyword search in let's say, you know, 80 or 90% of cases and can get you to 80 or 90% of the performance that you'd get with a custom trained neural network produced by a data science team. Um, so that's, that's uh, hopefully um, gives you some insight on that question. Uh, and then the question is, are you using a model like a multilingual sentence encoder or a custom model trained on the client's corpus? Uh, so we're using a general purpose uh, encoder um, if you're familiar with some of the models out there like BERT or Universal Sentence Encoder, so Universal Sentence Encoder um, QA, for instance, is actually a model that I was responsible for designing at Google. Uh, it's out there in the open domain, but that is my research focus, uh, is general purpose uh, neural networks that can be harnessed for information retrieval purposes. Um, so we're using, we've designed uh, our own general purpose uh, neural networks, and that's what's deployed. Okay, okay, cool. So uh, I'm going to just move move forward uh, a little bit now with the presentation um, and just you know keep asking questions as you have them. Uh, but what I'd like to do next is for, you know, I, I said this technology didn't exist before 2017. Um, I wanna give you some historical perspective on why the 2010s were a watershed decade for language understanding by computers. We entered 2010, with the best machine learned systems didn't have the comprehension skills of a four-year-old child. And we're leaving the 2010s where the best language understanding systems can match or even exceed human performance on a range of language tasks. It's been an amazing decade and there's three main breakthroughs I want to draw your attention to just to give you a, a little bit of context on, on why this is happening and why I'm talking about all of this right now. Okay. So neural networks need to operate on numeric input. So if you're gonna process language with neural networks, you have to get the words and the sentences into some numerical format. The way this was done initially was with one hot vectors. And this is a very simple concept. Uh, imagine that you want to process a language like English. If you take an inventory of the top 10,000 most common words and assign every word an ID, okay? And now every word is represented by a 10,000 dimensional vector that's zero everywhere and has the value of one at its index location. So for example, king is ID 17, so it's got a one in position 17 and zeros everywhere else. Queen is ID two, so it's got a one in position two. The problem with this approach is uh, that there's no structure to the geometry. King and queen are semantically related to each other, but their vector distance is as far apart as any two random words in the English language with this approach. Uh, and that's why neural networks that were dealing with this kind of input really struggled and couldn't make very good progress. So that changed in 2013 with the introduction of word vectors. And that's one of the key breakthroughs I wanna draw your attention to. A word vector is um, dense. It means it's, it's basically non-zero everywhere. Uh, it captures uh, in this, the geometric space, uh, the structure of the geometric space or the vector space, the geometric structure of the vector space, sorry, I should say, uh, captures the semantic meanings of the words. Uh, so if you look at now the king and queen example, look at the ball on the right, uh, the two red dots now here are the king and queen vectors in this uh, uh, word vector space. And you can see that they're much closer together to one another than any two random words that you could pick uh, out of the vocabulary. Uh, so that's a key point. 
uh, these vectors tend to be much smaller. So they're 50 to 100 dimensions, not 10,000. Crucially, they can be learned in an unsupervised manner. So you can learn word vectors by passing in a Wikipedia corpus or a Project Gutenberg corpus. And then this idea of turning a word into a, a vector such that the, 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 the structure of the vector space reflects semantics can be extended and was extended after 2013 to include sentences, paragraphs, and even documents. And, and how to do this well is still a very important and hot area of research in the NLP community. Okay, uh, moving forward then uh, to 2017, um, you know, language is, is um, essentially, it's a, it's a one dimensional sequence and man kills bull is very different than bull kills man and the idea it expresses. So <clears throat> a neural network, when it's considering language needs to fundamentally understand the concept of sequence uh, and, and know that sequence matters. And feed forward neural, ne feed forward neural networks, uh, which are the uh, easiest to train, the easiest to productionize and scale up very well, uh, didn't really have that knowledge. They would look at a sentence and treat it as kind of a bag of words. Um, and what was actually, you know, a more successful, a more successful strategy for dealing with language was using recurrent neural networks that do model sequences. And there was a particular type called LSTMs, which became, you know, very successful on a range of language processing tasks between 2013 and 17, once word vectors, uh, the idea of word vectors were introduced. In 2017, transformers uh, brought the advantages of the recurrent neural network paradigm where sequence was important, sequence was taken into consideration, brought it into a feed forward neural network paradigm. So you kind of got the advantages of both uh, the, the sequence modeling, but with the scalability and trainability of feed forward neural networks. And this revolutionized or it made a huge impact in every area of deep learning, uh, but nowhere more so than language understanding because language understanding is so sequential uh, in its nature, it's, it's baked into it. In, in that year, 2017, I was about a year into uh, work on general information retrieval with neural networks. We had a pretty good system going. We were trying to launch a product called Google Talk to Books, um, but the quality wasn't quite good enough. And we were one of the first teams uh, in research to actually take transformers and apply them in a production system. Uh, one of my coworkers there uh, rewrote transformers and made it production ready. And we saw this enormous jump in F1 score just by changing densely connected neural network layers with the transformer. Uh, so 27% for those of you who work in data science, it's, it's, it's a huge jump. And it's amazing that it was only, that, that nothing changed in the training data, nothing changed in the eval task. We literally swapped uh, one style of neural network layer for a transformer and we saw this enormous jump. And this is what actually allowed us to launch uh, Google Talk to Books in my opinion. Uh, without this, the quality of that system wouldn't have been good. You can check it out. I think. To my knowledge, it's the first end-to-end -end information retrieval system that's based on neural networks. You can search about a corpus of 200,000 books um, uh, and it, it will be using neural networks to do the retrieval in the background. Okay, so that was the second big breakthrough. And then the last breakthrough uh, was popularized in 2018 with a system called BERT, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. And Bird introduced this idea uh, to the um, popularize this idea of unsupervised pre-training. Uh, see, I have as humans, we have a knowledge of language that we carry around with us, and we can apply to different tasks. So, if you give me a paragraph to read from a medical textbook, I can take my general understanding of how the English language works and understand something from that paragraph. It might not be as much as a doctor would understand, but I can get something out of it. Uh, and a neural network, which claims to understand language ought to have the same property. So BERT uh, trains in an unsupervised fashion on a large corpus of text. Essentially, to simplify it down, it's a, it's a fill in the blank kind of game. So John bought eggs at the blank and the neural network has to predict what goes in the blank. And over time, it learns not only syntax and semantics, but even pragmatics. So for instance, uh, that this is most likely to be at the store. You buy eggs at the store. So it really teases out very fine-grained statistical patterns uh, in the data. Uh, and you essentially end up with a neural network that feels like it has a lot of common sense. So John blanked eggs at the supermarket. You could cook them or you could buy eggs. 
but in the context of the supermarket, you would buy them, not cook them. Uh, and, and the network can learn these things. And once you have a neural network that's good at this task, then with a very little amount of fine tuning data, you can, you can specialize it to any task that you want. And so BERT was not only the first system, uh, language understanding system that exceeded human performance on the Stanford question answering data set, which is a you know, challenging question answering benchmark in the NLP community. But at the same time, it broke records, I think on a dozen other uh, language understanding benchmarks, which showed you know, how, versa how versatile it was and it cemented this as you know, the approach post 2018 uh, for dealing with language understanding. You take an off the shelf model and you fine tune it. The drawbacks of BERT, uh, is, so this was the third breakthrough that I wanted to share uh, of, of the decade that I think is very significant. The drawbacks though, are that it's, it's, a, it's an ON search. So if you wanna search five documents for the answer to a question, it has to scan the documents linearly. Uh, and add to that the fact that it's very, very CPU intensive. It's not something that you can really productionize. Um, and that's, that's exactly where the value of a platform as a service uh, for semantic search comes in, that these are the kinds of problems that the platform will tackle for you and ensure that the system scales up to a large data set. All right. So any, any uh, questions so far? Otherwise, uh, I would like to move on to the next topic. Um, okay, and, and the next topic uh, that I want to basically discuss is what's the anatomy of a, an information retrieval pipeline? Uh, and every one of these pieces in the pipeline has a classical analog and then it has a neural analog, uh, and I'll briefly discuss both of those. So you understand most search systems that you see out there today uh, have one or more of the components I'm about to show you. So we take it as a query comes into the system. The first thing that happens usually in, in more sophisticated search systems is query routing. So for instance, when you search for something on Google, uh, based on what the intent of the query is, it might run that query against Google News or YouTube videos or just the web, uh, but that depends on the intent. Uh, so that's called query routing, or it might run the query against all of those backends. When one of those backends receives the query, it has to take the query and potentially search thousands or millions of documents and very quickly return the most relevant set. That's called, the, that's the retrieval step of the pipeline. Uh, so retrieval is handled, uh, can be handled with uh, algorithms like BM25, which is what um, Elasticsearch uses, for instance, uh, or it can be handled directly uh, as a vector retrieval problem, which is how many neural information retrieval systems Okay, and there's pros and cons to both, uh, and both are actually used in neural information retrieval systems, and I'll explain that more in the next slide. Uh, but a BM25 system is very scalable. Uh, keyword search systems can search billions of documents very fast. It's computationally inexpensive relative to uh, a neural search. On the other hand, uh, a, a, a neural search that's doing a, a search over a vector database has some advantages too. First of all, it can retrieve results where there's no keyword overlap, uh, which a keyword search cannot do. And then as a corollary, it's able to do things like run a cross-lingual search, uh, where by definition, there's no keyword overlap. Uh, and, and a BM25 based search cannot do that either. Once the results uh, are back, potentially from multiple backend systems, uh, you need to merge it into a final list. And that's what the uh, next step handles. Re-ranking uh, involves taking the different result sets, putting them into a final list, potentially resorting those results uh, into a final order. And the idea is the retrieval step has to be very fast, but with re-ranking, you're only looking at 10 or 20 or 30 documents. You can run a much more expensive algorithm to produce a higher quality sorting of, of, of those results. So traditionally, uh, random forests uh, were used here. I think it's always done with some form of machine learning. A random forest can work well, but more recently, cross-attentional neural networks um, like BERT, the kinds that do the sequential scans, uh, these are used. So you have Electra, Roberta, BERT. Uh, it's, it's still important here. Those models generally have to be distilled because they still don't run fast enough and they're too computationally intensive to directly include in the re-ranking step, but some variant of them tends to be used. Okay. Once re-ranking is complete, uh, you need to extract snippets because once you move beyond 
matching keywords in a title. When you're just matching keywords with the title of a document, it's really obvious when you show the search results why you're showing that result. But if you go back to the router demo I showed you, the title didn't have any connection to the query. It was a sentence that was buried inside that had something to do with the query. So you need to then take like those top five results or however many you're gonna show and find that relevant snippet so that you can show that on the results screen to the user. Um, the interesting thing about snippet extraction is that um, sometimes the retrieval, the retrieval step can actually do the snippet extraction as well automatically. And that's the case, for instance, with uh, our semantic search platform. Uh, in that case, you can actually feed the snippet into re-ranking and make the re-ranking step more accurate. But generally speaking, if the retrieval step doesn't support snippet extraction, you need to do snippet extraction after re-ranking because it's quite computationally ex expensive. So once you know exactly what the top five documents are, you run the algorithm uh, on that. And that this tends to be done as well with neural networks, okay? Uh, and then the last step uh, is statistical calibration. And statistical calibration refers to the following. Uh, when I run uh, uh, Solar or Elasticsearch, I get a BM25 score back. How am I supposed to interpret a score of 15 versus a score of 22? Okay, higher scores are better, 22 is better than 15, but how much better? Uh, it's not clear. Uh, with a neural network, the problem is even worse. Uh, if, if my BERT re-ranker is telling me that this has a score of 0.7 and this other results got a score of 0.9, what do those mean? It's very tempting to interpret those as probabilities. 0.7 means 70% chance of correctness. Well, it would be nice uh, to be able to say that, but that's actually not the case at all. Um, th those are numbers on the scale of zero to one, but they do not correspond to probabilities. And in fact, there's a lot of research that shows that as your neural networks get deeper, uh, they become less and less calibrated, more and more skewed to just predicting at the extremes. So although they're very accurate, you really, it's hard for a human to interpret what those numbers mean exactly. So calibration refers to mapping the scores coming out of your uh, information retrieval pipeline to tr actual likelihoods. So that when, when the system assigns a score of 0.7, it means 70% chance that that answer is correct and relevant. And then you can actually reason about what the system is doing and whether you even wanna show the search result or not. Uh, along, along the way, someone's asked a question. Tina um, has asked, can you recommend literature on the semantic search pipeline, especially post 2018? Uh, I think, um, so for that, um, there is a, there's a book that I referred to a few times from Microsoft Research uh, called uh, hold on, the name's slipping my mind. I, I have it in the resources of the slides, and I think we can share these slides out at the end. Um, unfortunately, yeah, there's not a lot of... Yeah, I'll, I'll, let me get back to you on that, okay? So I'll, I'll, I'll think about some good resource to share uh, on, on these pipelines uh, post-2018. Um, okay, um, so let me, let me just... Um, give you an overview of a few of the solutions that are out in the market now. So this is a very new area. These solutions are very new, uh, but I just want to compare them for you uh, on the basis of the understanding that I've laid out here on this slide. Okay, so uh, here's a few solutions on the market. Amazon Kendra launched in 2020. Microsoft Semantic Search launched this year. Uh, they're kind of still in a beta format, and we've got Xero Semantic Search, of course, that's the, the company that I'm, I'm running uh, at the moment. And you know, across the top, uh, we just got uh, some of the, the different features. So for instance, interestingly, Amazon Kendra and Microsoft Semantic Search use BM25 for retrieval. It's a good choice in a lot of ways uh, because it gives you a lot of scalability. Uh, and then they re-rank the results that come out of BM25 search with a neural network. Um, so that's also nice because it basically guarantees that you're gonna get better performance than a keyword search. On the other hand, one of the downsides of this approach is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you can't match results where there's no keywords overlap. Um, and, and you also can't do the cross-lingual case, which might be important in some cases and might not be. Uh, all of these systems do snippet extraction. Unfortunately, none of them do calibration yet, uh, although I assume that's basically a priority uh, on the roadmap for all of these products. Okay, so these are some of the commercial options uh, that are available today. There's also other solutions out there that will give you uh, part, of, part of the overall uh, pipeline, but maybe not the whole thing. So if any of you are familiar with Pinecone IO, they basically give you a very scalable vector database in the cloud, Google Vertex matching engine as well. 
but essentially you need to bring your own neural network. You need to bring your own document segmentation algorithms. There's a lot that they don't do for you. Um, and these systems on this presenting on this slide are more end to end. Is there an open source option for this? Um, you know, uh, on so so there are companies. Um, th there is a Gina J I N A, uh, which seems to be doing interesting work in this space, and I think they've got an open source version of what they do. Uh, and there's uh, maybe Weaveate, W E A V Weave Weaveate. Uh, is out there. These are all pretty recent, uh, so it's kind of hard to keep track of all of them. Uh, they all basically came out in 2000, late 2020, early 2021. Uh, this is an early field. Uh, the reason I'm excited about it is I think the potential is there. Like every business has a lot of search problems uh, that they need to solve, and nobody's got a team of data scientists to dedicate to solving that problem. Those economics don't work. And, and this neural information retrieval has the potential to give you a high quality, almost Google-like search on any data set, um, but, but it's still early days. Um, and then the question from June is, does Google have a semantic search service? And um, so they've got Google Vertex, Vertex Matching Engine, which is the vector database, uh, but that's not a full solution. They have solutions, Google has solutions that ad take advantage of semantic search, but they don't offer semantic search as a, as a platform or as a service which you can just push data into and run a search on. I don't think they offer that. They have tools like Contact Center AI and Dialogflow for, for contact center in, in automation that's in their cloud that uses semantic search on the back end, uh, but a general platform, no. no. I mean, there's a question from Sean. So the other results of each, each search back, uh, back propagate each time, or does the neural net just stars at the, in the same state for each search? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, so, so the results of other searches are not back propagated. Uh, the neural network is in the same state for each search. Uh, however, that's a good point um, that, so, so as you start to collect feedback on which searches work well and which, one, which, which results were good and which results were bad, the question is how do you leverage that data to improve the overall search pipeline? Uh, honestly, it's a, maybe a, a bit of a longer topic, but just really quickly, um, generally the best way to do that is to, is to take that and use it as training data for the re-ranking step. Uh, the, retriever, the retrievers require a lot of data to train, so it's hard to fine tune with like a small amount of, of feedback or click data from your customers. But the re-rankers, uh, depending on which algorithms you're using, especially if you're using a random forest, can be very sensitive to a small amount of training examples and can rapidly improve the quality of, of your search. Um, so, um, yeah, at, at a high level, that's that's the answer to your question. Um, but the, the neural network is not being trained online or dynamically as it's receiving queries. It's it's basically trained once, it's baked, and then that's deployed. That's how it generally works. So um, what, and then and then what's the retrieval step like? Vector matches to other vectors via LSH or some approximate nearest neighbor strategy. It's a fantastic question. Uh, and, and vector databases are a fascinating area themselves. And there's a lot of options for how you uh, approximate. So for those of you, let me just motivate the problem. If you're searching in a two-dimensional vector space, you might have heard of the quad tree algorithm. It's been around for a long time and it's used by Google Maps and other systems for searching, finding nearby points. When you generalize to higher dimensions, the problem uh, um, of finding nearest neighbors becomes very challenging. And there's a lot of algorithms out there uh, with different trade-offs. So LSH uh, is, is one that's still used today. Uh, there's other strategies um, so that involve you know, different uh, you know, quantization and clustering schemes. And you, you know, there's libraries, if you wanna know more about this area, there's libraries like Annoy, NMSLib, uh, FIAS, F-A-I-S-S from Facebook is an excellent implementation. Um, and, and all of those, you know, you can go into them and they'll show you the different strategies that are available. Um, and, 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 you know, realistically, there's no one best strategy. Uh, what, what you generally do is you measure something called the recall of the index and you have a target recall. Like I need 97% recall on this index of vectors. And then you iterate through a few different strategies and find out which one is going to get you 97% recall while also achieving you know, the latency that you need, the memory use that you need. Uh, so it's a challenging multidimensional problem in and of itself. 
index optimization. And again, that's one of the places where the, the platform as a service options can save some time because for instance, in the case of Zero Semantic Search, uh, the index is auto-optimized. Uh, and this process of going through the different options and compacting the index and getting the best performance out of it happens transparently behind the scenes. Um, so, um, but it's, 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 it's a very good question. Um, and then there's another question, how would you compare the performance of symbolic search versus neural search? Uh, so I, um, if I understand uh, symbolic search, are you referring to searching with, let's say, an explicit knowledge graph? Assuming, assuming that that's the case, I guess one of the differences that I'm thinking of is, you know, how easy is it to roll out on my own data set. A company like Google has a very large explicit knowledge graph and, and so does Microsoft. Uh, and that gives you very precise results. Oh, oh, some, oh uh, okay, sorry. The question was not about knowledge graphs. It was about solar elastic search versus neural. Um, so in general, um, there are certain problems for which a symbolic or keyword search is exactly what you want. If I'm searching the VIN number of a car, I need an exact match, not some somebody else's car coming up with a similar VIN number. That's not going to do, do the job. But there's a lot of cases uh, where, you know, you, I, I need a system that can understand the meaning and return relevant results. And in those cases, neural search um, is, is generally quite far beyond. So if you look at metrics like mean average precision, um, when people are, uh, issuing open-ended queries where they don't know the answer in advance, uh, they're doing some research, the gap in mean average precision between a neural system and a BM25-based system like a solar Elasticsearch can be very large. Up to 25 points is what I've seen in some of the research papers out there. Um, and then is the atomic unit of the current word vectors the word, the stemmed word, or are phrases included as well? Are words that have multiple meanings or parts of speech assigned multiple vectors? So the, so the second part of that question, no, uh, there's one vector for the word that captures uh, all of its different meanings. Um, and and um, coming to the first part though, the systems uh, that we're discussing today are, are actually beyond word vectors. They don't use word vectors. They use vectors that can capture the level of the entire document, document vectors or paragraph vectors, for instance. So they're actually embedding uh, the meaning of, of much larger units into vectors. That's how they work. Um, so, so the issue of whether, wh whether you're working with a stemmed word or phrases doesn't, doesn't really come up there. Um, but uh, in the context of word vectors, uh, there's generally, they don't do any sort of stemming. Uh, so run would have a different word vector from runs. Uh, and it sounds like that's a limitation, but actually that turns out to be a, a nice feature. Um, because, because there's cases where the plural of the word really has a very different semantic and pragmatic usage than the, the singular form. So, okay. Um, so I'm going to, um, it's about 1248. So I'm going to just show you one more example here. Uh, do you use a pre-trained model is another question. And the answer is yes, uh, we use a pre-trained model. Uh, we train the model ahead of time. It's designed to perform well in a wide range of domains. Uh, and I think using a pre-trained model is actually the key to commercialization of this technology. Uh, training a, a model per data set is, is just too expensive. Um, so yeah. um, again, customization for the data set, generally it's most feasible and efficient to do that in the re-ranking step of the information retrieval pipeline. So I wanna conclude with one example that's a non-obvious semantic search use case, and that's decision support. And this is from one of our actual customers. Um, and I've just kind of abstracted it slightly, but it's a child welfare agency in the Midwest. And uh, their use case goes like this. Uh, case workers visit children who are in state custody in the foster care system uh, twice a month, and they take detailed notes on the uh, living conditions of the child, whether the child seems happy or not, any, any hazards that they observe. And they're trained in how to take these notes. And these notes accumulate in the child's case file. And then at certain times of the year, uh, once or twice a year, those cases come up for review uh, in the central office. And uh, an administrator is reviewing the case notes. 
and answering a questionnaire. And the answers on that questionnaire determine the future of the child in the, in the foster or the child welfare system and the foster care system. Uh, so the problem is that uh, a lot of times information is missed because it's people reading through a large number of case notes and they have a limited budget of 30 minutes per case. Uh, and they miss information, and sometimes the results of missing that information can be very costly, uh, especially costly to the child. So they wanted to minimize the errors, and uh, the, way, the way that that can be done with semantic search, that's actually, let me just show you. So here's an example. Here's an example of, on my screen of a, a realistic case note. It's fictitious, but it's realistic. It's actually used for training workers on how to take the case notes. And this is the case of a child named Sandy. She was removed from her home by Child Protective Services and placed into foster care. Uh, and now this worker has gone to visit Sandy and is exploring the interactions and documenting the interactions between the, the mother and the teachers and Sandy and all of that is here in this case note. Okay, so um, we've taken this case note and we've indexed it into a semantic search platform. Okay, and I'm just gonna run a small set of queries uh, on this case note. So now the results that are coming back are only from this single case note. It could also be from all the case notes over the past year. This is just a quick example. And the way we're going to use these results coming back uh, are as supplemental evidence in the questionnaire. So for instance, if the questionnaire asks, are there any documented cases of physical abuse in the past 12 months? It would be very nice if you had a system that can actually show that, okay, in the case notes for the past 12 months, Here's where, where the system thinks there might be documented physical abuse. So let's, let's just actually try that example, right? So I'm going to try saying the query is physical abuse, okay? And now the results that are coming back are just from that one document. Sandy was removed from her home by CPS and placed in foster care after her teacher observed multiple bruises on Sandy's body. Okay, so this is clearly an instance of physical abuse, but it doesn't have the word physical or the word abuse in it. Mother claimed she was unaware of the injuries. Sandy said the mother's boyfriend often hit her for no reason. So a lot of things related to physical abuse that don't have either of those words, uh, but they, they come up and it would be, you know, it's really helpful for an administrator to basically see these right on the screen as they're trying to fill out that questionnaire. If I change from physical abuse uh, to substance abuse, and I run the query, now the results change. Mother has a history of drug and alcohol use and was intoxicated at the time of investigation. Uh, the caseworker explored the frequency of alcohol consumption. Miss um, White stated she'd been drinking two or three cans of beer. So here there's actually an association made between beer and substance abuse. Uh, so it's actually very, very flexible in the way it's matching. And, and it's operating on this data more like a, like a human would. Uh, as opposed to the way a keyword system would, would work. A keyword system wouldn't be able to be, pull up any of the results I'm showing you right now. Um, so this is an example of, of applying a semantic search system for something that doesn't look like search. It's basically decision support at this point. Uh, so I think we're at 12.53 now, and I'm just gonna leave the last few minutes for questions. This is a fan fantastic, you know, fantastic talk, and you know, it's a, a lot of stuff in it, and uh, it's amazing actually to see this is actually in action. So uh, uh, those who has questions uh, probably uh, can just post directly on the chat, and uh, we can get to it. Yeah, uh, for those, uh, some people said that they got interrupted by, uh, you know, um, somehow. I'll, I'll post the recording after in YouTube, so uh, so we'll share that in the Meetup page. Uh, so there's a question about whether the pre-trained model is similar to T5. So um, the answer is uh, our model is actually smaller than T5. Uh, and T5 and BERT size models uh, don't scale well to production workloads. Uh, so we're fundamentally not using a cross attentional model. This is a dual encoder model, which is appropriate for retrieval. But it's also a dual encoder model uh, that can run very fast and with pretty low latency. Uh, so uh, it's, it's smaller than T5. Um, for, and then the other question was for decision support, potentially this can be used to pre-fill questions and answers. Yes, yes, that's, a, that's another good, good point. So what you would do there is if the system can find a result and it's confident enough in the result, you can pre-fill the answer. 
uh, and that would save the user some time. So in general, with the decision support system, you don't want to automate the decision making completely. You want a human in the loop, but you can pre-fill forms or you can show supporting evidence and really uh, cut down on mistakes that way. What are the unit economics like for Zer versus hosted Elasticsearch or Algolia or similar? Yeah, so, so semantic search uh, is, is more expensive. Um, so Microsoft hasn't released pricing yet, uh, at least not the last time I checked. Uh, Amazon Kendra, I think, is $1,000 a month is an entry price now. Last year, it was 5000 They cut the price this year. Um, and that's over like 10 gigabytes. Uh, in, in the case of Xer Semantic Search, it's about $500, uh, $500 a month for a gigabyte that can be spread out over 500, 500 different indexes. Um, and the gigabyte maybe doesn't sound like a lot, but we're just talking about the text itself. So a gigabyte of text is actually, it's, it's quite a lot. Um, you can potentially tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of documents easily, depending on the size of documents, even potentially, you know, a million documents could fit in that. Uh, can you talk a bit about the infrastructure this is hosted on? Uh, yeah, so, so um, there's two questions, I guess you could say is like, what, what are some of the ingredients in the infrastructure? Uh, like, you know, um, the infrastructure from a customer's point of view looks very similar to Elastic or Algolia. Uh, you spin up an instance, you push your data in, your textual data in, and then you run queries uh, on the data uh, uh, and get results back. Uh, so from a customer's point of view, that's how it looks. Internally, what are some of the ingredients uh, that are needed to make it all work? You've got the vector databases that I alluded to in the case of Kendra and, and uh, Microsoft Semantic Search, they've also got um, a, a BM25, like inverted index setup in there. Uh, they've got, then you've got the neural networks that do the actual encoding, or in the case of, of those systems, they have neural networks that do the re-ranking. Uh, so, uh, you know, you have, you have to optimize those servers. Uh, in the case of Microsoft, for instance, they've optimized so that those neural networks for re-ranking running on GPU instances. Um, which are which are fairly expensive normally, but you know you so you have to pick and choose where to use it. So those are some of the different ingredients that go into all of this. You you have to have an index optimizer because the index fragments over time. The the recall of the vector index dips, and you need to rebuild it. So there's a lot of different pieces behind behind the curtains. Um, can this be put into a pipeline to say identify identify customers likely to churn based on incoming email and social tests? Yeah, that's that's actually a, a very good application for this because you can identify based on underlying meanings. So uh, you can look for instance, for like a phrase like, um, uh, you know, um, uh, customer support didn't help me. Uh, the, the, the presence of a statement like that somewhere in the history of the customer's interactions is probably quite predictive of churn uh, because when they start making those kind of statements, you know, they're, they're likely to churn soon. So, um, you know, you can reliably, uh, detect the presence of those statements with semantic search. You can do it much more reliably with semantic search than with keyword search. So that's, that's another good example. So uh, just follow that. Suppose you want to do that pretty sure use of this technology, but then you, you have to have some APIs to able to extract the search results and then put that into the data pipeline to do additional search, you know, model trainings, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So, so uh, one of the ways that you can do this uh, is, is as follows. Uh, you have a database, essentially your index consists of uh, phrases uh, that whose presence would be predictive of churn. Like um, I'm, I'm, the, the, uh, you know, the, the quality of the product is no good, is broken or something like that. Uh, or, or my interaction with customer service was frustrating. Right. Now your pipeline would look like this. You would, you know, an, an email would come in. Okay, uh, you break the email into, let's say, sentences. You send those sentences actually become the queries against that index, and the system is going to return the top matching sentences from the index that match with, with, with phrases in the email. And it's yeah. going to return a score associated with those as well. And so now if the scores go beyond a certain threshold, it means that, okay, that statement, some variation of that statement was in this customer's email. How do you determine what those thresholds are? The right way to do it is actually with the machine learning system. So I would, for instance, use a random forest, take the results coming from the semantic search system as essentially features that feed into the random forest, and I can combine it with additional features. And then the random forest is making the final determination on 
you know, the sentiment of the email or what thoughts it's expressing. Right. Yeah. There is a question you missed uh, earlier. I think that there is somewhere. So this was specific for your company. So it does zero platform support attribute search besides semantic sim similarity? Oh, uh, oh that's, a, that's a fantastic question. Uh, and actually uh, the answer to that is, uh, well, yes and no. It supports it today, but not in an efficient way. So when you index documents uh, or parts of documents, you can attach metadata and that metadata is returned in the results. However, the platform doesn't directly perform filtering on the metadata. So you're stuck with post filtering, which is problematic in a lot of cases. Like if you have a 10 million document index and you wanna search documents that were published in the first week of January, 2020, maybe that's only 0.5% of the documents in there. So post filtering is not gonna be efficient. So we're actually in the process of, of implementing and we will roll out in Q1, uh, a very efficient way to perform like a predicate uh, expression matching uh, at the time that the query runs. Uh, so that you could, at, in the query, you can say that, you know, the publish, publishing date of the document needs to be the first week of 2020. And it can, uh, you know, restrict the subset of documents it's searching very efficiently, but it's, it's not there yet. Yeah, there are some vector engines though, just for your information that do already incorporate that. So two that I'm thinking of is uh, the Google uh, Vertex Matching Engine supports that and uh, 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 Pinecone IO. Uh, they're just, ven they, these guys are ven vendors of, of vector databases. They're not giving the full pipeline, but those vector databases have that, cap have that capability. Yeah. Yeah, this is the excellent talks, uh, you know, you know, uh, we are, I think, just the uh, at the hour, 1, 1, uh, 1 p.m. So, yeah, this is fascinating, frankly, very educational. So uh, I thank really you like all that. for coming. Yeah. Thank so you. Uh, if you can, you can share the slides with me. I can share with the with the, with the, with the members as well. Okay. We will do. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all.